Hello, um, so in this video, I would like to continue doing a uh, threat taxonomy, and this is going to be part two of my uh, threat taxonomy series. Uh, so if you recall, in the previous video of the series, I talked about three different dimensions along which you could categorize threats. So what were those three dimensions? Uh, well, the first dimension was how the threat propagated. So we'll, we talked about propagation um, of threats, so three dimensions, and the first was propagation. propagation. The second one, uh, which is going to be the subject of this video, is the harm done. So we'll talk about how, what kinds of harm a threat might do on the system. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about harm done in this video. Harm done. And then the final category, which we'll maybe talk about in a future video, or maybe perhaps in the next video, uh, will be the category of how that threat stays resilient on the system. To resiliency. Okay, so um, let, let's talk about a bit about what kinds of harm a uh, a threat can do. And, and and to keep it, and I'd like you to bear in mind that these these three dimensions are kind of convenient for me to think about threats. But you may think of other ways to taxonomize them. This is just one way in which we can kind of organize how we discuss threats. Uh, the first thing I do want to mention is that harm in general, this is a, a very subjective statement. And, and so, um, you know, what might be considered harmful for one person might not be considered harmful for somebody else. And, and sometimes we actually see lots of instances of this where a threat in particular may not actually do something bad on the actual end user system, but it could have some overall negative effect uh, in, in some broader, uh, much broader sense. Um, and we'll talk about how that comes up, and especially in the context of spam that's going to come up, but we'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, so to begin with, it, it's the first interesting category of threats, or what we call um, backdoors. Um, and these are threats that are designed to kind of create a, a backdoor onto the system, and, and then later on exploit that backdoor and allow the attacker to get on the system. And we often also uh, see the nomenclature remote access trojan. Remote access trojan. And if you recall, a trojan from the previous video is basically a standalone piece of malicious software. So it doesn't uh, need a host of any sort. It just has to be on the machine. The software works in and of itself. And a remote access trojan or a backdoor basically is a way for an attacker to um, get onto a system after he's exploited it. So let's say there's a system and the, the attacker has exploited that system. Uh, he might leave himself a little, a little way to get back in. And later on, from a remote location, maybe the attacker is over here, and from a remote location, he can get back onto the system at will uh, whenever he needs to, to do something bad. So that's one category of, of, uh, of harm that a system can, uh, that a particular piece of malware can do. Uh, another category of harm uh, is what we call the info stealer. Um, and info stealers, uh, you know, you, you kind of conjure up images of corporate espionage or uh, you know, something of that nature, maybe uh, you know, cyber warfare, etc. And this is really about how you can steal information, as, as the name might suggest. Info stealer is about stealing information. And this, this could involve, uh, you know, doing things like stealing uh, passwords. So, for example, if you use your computer for banking, uh, there are info stealers that are, are geared towards trying to steal bank passwords. Um, you could also imagine stealing somebody's files. Um, you know, figuring out what they're, what types of things they're doing on their computer, et cetera, et cetera. And these are just um, one class of examples. And, and aside from corporate espionage, you actually probably more commonly see info stealers uh, in the consumer world um, because people are using their systems or computers to do uh, more and more uh, things in the way of sensitive transactions. Like pe people are making online payments, they're they're going to their bank accounts, they're paying their taxes, et cetera. And so there's a lot of really useful sensitive information on the systems. I mean, also um, other sensitive data like maybe social security numbers, et cetera, might be on the system. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that an info stealer might target. Um, the third interesting category, and I think this is um, interesting for a couple of reasons, but the third interesting category of, uh, uh, of, of things that can cause harm are what we call spam bots. And, and spam, uh, in many ways, is kind of like Surprisingly, even you might think, well, spam, well, who cares about spam? Or maybe yeah, spam is annoying, and you might not think of this as a particularly consequential uh, category of threat. But it turns out that 
Spam is just one of the most frequent uses of malware out there. And you might be wondering, like, why on earth would, would somebody really care that much about spam and why is it the most popular thing that you, you tend to see uh, malware do? And that's because spam is just really big business. And, and you know, malware authors are now a days in, in, the, in the business of making money. I guess that's it's kind of a superfluous phrase. But for the most part, malware authors are trying to make money. And what they're effectively going to try to do is, is the following. They basically, they'll, they'll compromise a computer system somewhere. So let's say they've compromised uh, this computer system. And then they're going to use that computer system to send out spam emails to people. So later, here's, here's a, you know, I guess an envelope. But imagine this is actually spam. So this is a piece of spam being sent out. Now, it turns out what, what's typically going to happen is that uh, there are companies out there that do anti-spam. A lot of popular email programs, uh, online email programs, etc., do have anti-spam technologies. And one way in which uh, they try to block spam is, is they look for hosts that are sending out spam. So for example, they might identify that, hey, this particular host, this guy's a bad guy, he's sending out a lot of spam email. So they might go ahead and block all the IP addresses or, or all um, known IPs for, for these bad hosts. And then that would in turn block the spam coming from these hosts. Now, a good spammer, um, if he's compromised one system, it will he's going to be out of business. But the reality is that these guys actually go ahead and they compromise many, many systems. So in fact, in addition to, to just this one system sending out spam, they may have like a half dozen, actually many tens of thousands for that matter, uh, in the offshoots just waiting uh, to send out more spam uh, when the first one goes down. And the idea is that you know, if, you, if you block any one of these systems, another one's just going to come up. So, you know, if you block this system and, and take it off the network, um, another one will just come up and, and you know this system is still running and this system is still running, etc. And so the idea is that spammers can kind of get a, uh, I guess, a, a cache of just fresh IP addresses. And then there's really the idea is that um, the location of those systems are, are going to be new each time. And so even if you've uh, blocked one of those systems, the other ones might be outside the purview of a typical anti-spam company. They may not know yet to block it. So it's, it's a really powerful thing. And ultimately, you know, as, it, as funny as it might seem, even though most people tend to ignore spam emails, I and mean, I, I don't really look at them very often, uh, except maybe for research purposes, but um, most people just delete spam, and, or, or it goes in their spam folder. But the reality is that there's a small fraction of people, there's a small number of people who say, hey, maybe I really want to buy these, these cheap pills, or maybe I really want to buy um, these fake Rolex watches, or what, what have you. And so even if they get a small conversion rate, even if a small fraction of people go ahead and respond to that spam message and buy whatever product is being offered, that enough, um, that can be enough to make the whole enterprise profitable because it's so cheap to send out email that, and it's so cheap to do spam that even if a very, very small fraction of people go ahead and, and, uh, and download or go ahead and, and follow up on that purchase, uh, that'll be enough to justify the spammers activities. And so that's why you see so much in the way of spam. And that's why in many ways, it's kind of the, the killer application, if you will, for uh, for most malware. And in fact, a lot of botnets uh, do use spam, uh, and, and a lot of them are, are really geared around are sending out spam. Uh, the other thing that you typically will see um, uh, in terms of the harm done is, is what we call a downloader. Um, and as you might expect, a downloader, all it does is it just downloads other stuff on the system. Um, and downloaders are um, primarily just used for that. And the idea is that they kind of lead to what we call staged attacks. And so the idea is in the first stage, uh, you get infected with a downloader, uh, and then in subsequent stages, the downloader will go ahead and download other pieces of software onto the system. Okay, and now a lot of effort can go specifically into kind of making the downloader resilient to detection. And actually, we'll talk about resilient in, in the next video, uh, resiliency rather in the next video. But downloaders can be made very robust, very difficult to detect. They can be made very small, etc. And then once they get on the system, now you've got a beachhead on that system and you can go ahead and download other stuff onto that system. And in fact, I've seen a lot of situations in which a particular anti-malware technology or vendor or approach, you know, they'll be able to detect maybe some of these things. They'll detect maybe the spam bot or the info stealer, but they won't detect the downloader that was used to bring that piece of malware onto the system in the first place. Okay, and so as a result, even though they've gotten the... the, the found some of the symptoms, some of the, the things that were downloaded, because they haven't gotten rid of the beachhead or the root cause, the system just keeps getting reinfected. And so it's, a, it's very powerful to, for a malware author to go ahead and, and try to find a downloader or, or put a downloader onto your system. Okay. Um, the last two categories that I do want to touch upon briefly are um, we call adware and spyware. And, and, and 
Um, th these are somewhat uh, subjective categories, but and I'll talk about why they're they're a bit subjective. But let me um, spell them first: adware and spyware. And what adware is designed to do is basically it's it's software that just basically displays ads on your system. Uh, and so sometimes when you're browsing one page, all of a sudden you'll see an ad pop up, and and uh, um, that ad will maybe prompt you to buy additional products, etc. Uh, and then spyware is basically software that can be used to record your activity. So for example, uh, recording keystrokes. Um, you can imagine recording uh, screenshots, etc. So keystrokes, uh, screenshots, and we often call uh, uh, keystroke loggers. We often call, we also talk about screen scrapers that, that, that look at what's going on in your screen, um, etc. And you may be wondering what, why this is objective. So first of all, in the case of, of adware, um, it's a bit murky because there may be legitimate use cases for AdWord. There, there are people out there maybe who are who like to buy a lot of stuff, who are, who are maybe very um, who consume a lot, and, and as a result, um, they may actually want to see ads being displayed on their system while they're browsing the web, and so they may find some benefit to these ads being displayed. Uh, and in terms of spyware, I mean this is maybe even more murky, but um, there are situations in which uh, you could legitimately want to monitor your system. So, for example. Uh, a parent might want to monitor their child's online activity, so they may install a piece of software on that system that monitors you know, what the, the what, what websites a child is visiting and maybe what what IMs they're sending out and so on and so forth. Now, again, you know, we're starting to talk about maybe some some more fuzzy ethical boundaries around monitoring activity, but you know, the, the reality is that um, you know there are some cases in which you might. Uh, uh, you might consider AdWords spyware to be legitimate, and, and that notwithstanding, I think these types of applications, um, as as you can probably imagine, they do toe the line a bit, or they can sometimes toe the line, uh, and some of them are more nefarious. So, for example, there are types of AdWords out there that are very difficult to disable, or they don't really tell you what they're doing on your system. They may be doing a lot of other stuff than what they might otherwise intimate to be doing, uh, and so um, they may be collecting more information. They may be uh, I don't know. Um, popping up ads when you don't want it. They may make they may make themselves very difficult to uninstall. And so there are even within adware and spyware there are classes of adware that are even more nefarious. Uh, and so the reality again is that harm is is a subjective notion. Uh, there are many different kinds of harm that a particular piece of malicious software can try to do. And and, and again, um, it, it's all up to kind of how you view things. And so with that, what I'll do is I will stop right here. And in the next video, I will talk a bit about how threats stay resilient.